Good evening and welcome to the Port Pie Library and Community Centre in Leicester for what it's hoped will be the first in a series of Meet the Mayor events, a chance for the people of Leicester to directly question their directly elected mayor. That is, of course, Sir Peter Soulsby, previously our city's longest serving council leader and the MP for Leicester South. Sir Peter was voted in as our first directly elected mayor in May 2011. He spent much of his inaugural term in office turning his ambitious vision for improving the look and appeal of our city into reality. And a large amount of time was also spent unearthing and reburying a certain medieval monarch. Not all of his decisions have proved popular and he's attracted criticism and opposition, but not enough to stop him being re-elected back in May for a second term in office. His deputy is Councillor Rory Palmer. Rory has been Sir Peter's loyal lieutenant throughout his time in charge and has taken on a number of important briefs, including heading up the Health and Wellbeing Board. As Deputy City Mayor, Rory also chairs the Child Poverty Commission, which continues to strive to drive down child poverty rates in the city. And he's also led on the city's plans for the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic celebrations. He is the Ward Councillor for Ayres Monsell. The third member of our panel this evening is Councillor Sarah Russell. She's one of eight assistant mayors who make up Peter Salisbury's executive team. She she has responsibility for children and young people services, a crucial and demanding role. And she is the ward councillor for Westcuts. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. <laughs> Let's get straight on to our first question. Nikki Jones. Hi there. Um, the majority of our roads in Leicester are in a really poor state of condition. What do you propose to do to rectify this? Sir Peter Salisbury. Well, I'm going to actually call Rory in a minute because um, he, um, when we were first elected four years ago, um, set about in the first 100 days uh, a major program of investment in our roads, particularly in the potholes in our roads. And I think we've been really quite successful in doing that. Certainly that's gauged by the number of complaints we get, which is very much reduced over the last, last four years. But it's not just about the potholes in the roads, it's about the condition of the roads more generally and people's ability to use them. And it's important that we continue to invest because the motor car in the city is just part of the lifeblood of the city. And that's why we're investing so heavily at the moment in the A50. You'll hear it on Radio Leicester every morning. Uh, people actually being held in the queues there as a result of the investment that we're making. So it's both the, the condition of the surfaces and those roads' ability to carry what is uh, still, I'm afraid to say, an increasing amount of very necessary traffic. But Rory, I think, might like, might, might like to add to that a bit. As Peter just said, back in 2011, uh, when the mayor was first elected and the new administration took office, one of the first things we did uh, was to increase the capital budget for roads maintenance in the city. We recognised at that point that uh, this was an issue of real concern to lots of residents in, in all parts of, uh, of Leicester. But in many ways, like every other council in the country, uh, we're running to catch up on this. It doesn't matter how much progress we make, and we'll continue to make progress and respond to, to problems there are, but when you've got a city like Leicester where all, a lot of roads were, were built at the same time, uh, where there was periods of, of underinvestment in their maintenance, we now have to, uh, to do what we can to, to keep the roads in good condition. And uh, unfortunately, at this point in time, we've, uh, we've, we've budgets been being cut by, by the government and facing ever decreasing resources it will be a case of prioritizing but let me be clear we're absolutely committed to making sure we have a, a road network that is uh, is befitting of a, of a modern ambitious city like Leicester that means the big investment projects Peter's talked about the A50 uh, the other big major improvement programs we've undertaken in recent years but also as importantly it is sorting out those potholes it is sorting out the road humps that might be damaged just down down the road in, in Ayres where I represent all of those things are important. Nikki is it is it the condition of the road roads or the congestion that upsets you most? Um, both the condition and the congestion and more so to add on to that the way that the city is at the minute especially in the mornings and well morning and evening and rush hour the emergency services the way it's going at the moment especially with the fire service and the courts and the proposal of getting at least five fire engines through the city within 10 minutes how is that going to happen because I mean, through rush hour, the roads are a block and you're never going to get those fire engines through. So, Peter, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because I know, that, that, you know, as, as Rory has outlined, lots of money and effort has been spent. And yet, we need one broken down van in one crucial part of the city, gridlock gate, as it became known. Uh, and you're getting cross with the police, the police are getting cross with you. And frankly, the, all the people that are held up in that are cross 
uh, for the rest of the morning because the city grinds to a halt. It's football. The, it took me 45 minutes to drive two miles from the city centre to here. So although the money's been spent, the congestion is still here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to this, Ben. I mean, I'm not going to pretend there is. Um, we've got a city, like most cities uh, in Europe and, and in North America, that were built at their heart at the time of the horse and cart. Uh, and weren't built um, for uh, the sort of traffic that they have to face in the 21st century. There's no easy answer to it. I mean, there really isn't. You can't build urban motorways all the way through an area like, like that. You just can't. Uh, and even if you did, they'd, they'd have to end somewhere. You have to find then space for, for all the vehicles. What you can do uh, is do, as we've tried to do, is to keep the network running, to make the best of it, and also to recognise you've got to make, sometimes make some difficult choices. And we've had to make some difficult choices in the city centre about whether we want it a place where people can walk about, where people feel comfortable uh, to, uh, to come in in public transport, get off, do their shopping, or whether you want to make space for cars and car parking. Which is, which is of course, I understand the difficult decisions that you have to make, but you know, thinking about the potholes, for example, there are potholes I can think of that are, that are older than I am, for heaven's sake, that have been there, that I've drawn people's <laughs> attention to, Actually, and, I, there the, and there they are, and you think I there's somebody somewhere, this, I hate somebody's just put some ben, tarmac in it. But uh, I think if you're suggesting they're older than you are, you're probably exaggerating. Well, there's if they're one even older than that. There's one I can think of but, on Vaughan Way that I crash over every no, single make, day on the way into work. To make a serious point, actually, Ben, I mean, there's no objective measure of the number of potholes. Uh, and, of course, potholes appear every winter. So, it, you know, it's, you're always trying to catch up on, 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 on what's happened in the last winter. But we have far less claims as a council for vehicles damaged by potholes than we had four or five years ago. And that's a fairly good measure, actually, of, you know, of, of the numbers out there. I'm not pretending for a minute there aren't potholes in some of our roads. There are. But the, the level of damage that is being caused by them, as measured by the number of claims we're getting, is dramatically reduced. Just as a matter of interest, anybody else in the, in the audience have thoughts about the roads in the city? I'll bring a microphone round to you, sir. What's your name, first of all? Mark Cartwright. And your thoughts? Well, my question was basically the same as the ladies over there. But um, what I'm really picking up on here is that they want to improve the road system and make traffic flow a lot better. So why did we reduce the Newarks and put an ultra-wide cycle lane in on one of the main roads around the city? And, as you said about the van breaking down, that was just horrendous around there. And we're trying to improve the flow through the city, yet we do things like that. What's the logic behind it? Do we want to stop traffic coming into town? Do we want to divert visitors away from town and go to other cities like Nottingham, Derby? What is the council's vision on it? I mean, it's, thank you. It's, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Can you defend that? I mean, can you particularly, thinking about the wide cycle uh, lane, well, I'm going to ask Sarah to respond a bit because um, I think, you know, she has uh, joined with me in, uh, you know, in actually looking at the balance that we have to strike between different types of, types of road, road users. But what's very interesting, although people see a narrowing in New York Street and in some other streets, the numbers of vehicles per hour going through there is at least as good as it was before that narrowing took place. Because actually... We do counts. I, I mean, I see, I see you shaking yeah, your head, but we actually, actually we do counts, and, and they're on the public record. But, Peter, I understand but, that, but, but you know, yeah. the, counts, the, pack, the fact is that people feel that it takes I, longer, that I, it's a pinch I, point, I, that I it's well a pain. I well understand that, but actually, Ben, the pinch points are the, are, the, are the traffic lights at either end of it. And if you think about it, where you're held up on Newark Street is not actually, for the most part, going down the street. It's about the traffic lights at the end. And so long as you can get those junctions moving, and we've done a lot to actually work to get those junctions moving better. We've been very successful in that. The time it takes to get round the ring road in general and through that bit of Newark Street is, if anything, better today than it was when there were three lanes down there. But Sarah's wanted to come in. Yeah, Sorry, I think yeah. just the, the flip side of that as well. So alongside my responsibilities in the executive, I represent the West Coats Ward, which is the area around Narborough Road. And for people who live in my area, less than 50% have access to a car. Actually, what it's meant is that people can cycle safely into work in the city. You've got a clear route through. You can actually actively encourage people not to go out and have to buy a car to be able to um, get on what are sadly still very expensive buses um, from where we are. And people can get in, can take up those opportunities, can shop and can work. And that does reduce the overall flow as well. So it, there is a balance with these. It is about you want some people to be able to cycle in. That reduces the number of cars on the road 
and can help things flowing. So there's always a, a, a mix with these. Let's, let's just hold that thought on cycling for a second. John Jones, where are you, John? John, do you want to ask your question? Thanks for coming today, by the way, Peter, with your team. Uh, you, like me, are a, a cyclist. And you said uh, in statements that you wish to double the amount of cyclists coming into the city. But what provisions are you making to improve cycling safety in the city? Peter, well, we'll get to you, but Sarah, because I know that when you come in to, in to be interviewed by me on Radio Leicester, you come in and you park your bike in our reception. I do indeed. I think there are, have been many, many improvements for cyclists, both in terms of being able to have the car-free routes um, and the separation from um, pedestrians as well, which I know most pedestrians are a lot more comfortable with, but also looking at things like the investment in the bike parks, both at the railway station and in the city centre, which make sure that people can safely and securely store their bikes, that they can feel they can drop off um, and nip into the shops. There are a variety of different ones these throughout the city. The other thing I think is giving people the confidence to be able to go out and cycle and we've seen that be developed through the lead rides that are going on and um, that there's a full programme of right the way through the year where people who aren't that confident can go out with other people on a, a relatively straightforward route, fairly short, to build their confidence up and I think there's, we've got to do lots and lots of different things if we want to encourage people to cycle because people have different reasons for not doing it and it's about trying to address all of those. Well, John, what's your experience of, of cycling in the city? This city, like many, have dedicated areas, and there, there are fantastic ones like the Great Central Way, mm. and of course the Newark's been mentioned at the moment, uh, which is very good to encourage students as well to use those routes. But this city, like many others, take the biggest vehicles on the road called buses, and they stick bikes with them. Uh, London is now rethinking its paths in that way, and we can learn from them. I mean, people have been injured, and we know that there's been some quite high-profile accidents in the city over the last couple of years. I think what we need to do is actually rethink how we look at traffic. We need to reach Kyoto agreements. Petrol prices are going to go up. We have the problem of not having cheap public transport, but we need to look at our transport policy, I sense, because I live on the Saffron Lane, I can remember when we used to have a three-minute service at rush hour in the mornings. Now, clearly the money isn't available for that at the moment. People are tending to use buses, and yet, you know, there's like Groningen. I actually sent to the mayor's office a, a video that Groningen in, in Holland has made where they quartered the city, and the two major crosses are cycle lanes. And then they looked at how they planned cars to be able to come in and out because people need to be able to use cars there are people with disabilities that need to be able to use cars uh, there are also those that are, are, are bringing goods in and out they actually looked at systems of hiring bikes of hiring things that are attached to bikes in order to cycle things out uh, so you can actually do quite large shops in that way all the parking's placed outside and not within the city which means you don't need to cycle within the city and everywhere could be accessed within five minutes uh, what provision can, can the city do to look at the whole of their transport policy and not do little bits in isolation? Mm -hmm. so, so, Peter, I mean, it would be interesting, actually, just paint me a picture. 20 years down the tracks, we're still, we're still here, and we're having another Meet the Mayor <laughs> event, and uh, we've all been cycling around the city centre. What does it look like? How does it, how does it mix? How do the cars, buses, lorries, bikes and stuff all mix? I think we're beginning to get there, actually. Uh, I think we're beginning to get a better balance. Uh, there's no perfect balance, but we're going to get a better balance between road users. One of the keys, though, I think, to improving and increasing the numbers of, uh, of cyclists is actually that degree of separation of, of cyclists, and particularly on some of the main radial routes coming into the city, uh, because that's what you know, deters people from coming in. If you have to struggle down Saffron Lane, Aylston Road, sharing a bus lane, uh, you wouldn't do it. You certainly wouldn't want a child to do it. Uh, you might feel brave yourself and, and give it a go, but, uh, but it's, it's not, a, not a realistic option. And I think some degree of separation is, is vital on, on those radial routes. But I do think that we've got to continue to uh, improve provision within the city centre as well. Make sure that we've got places for all road users to park, uh, including cyclists and motorcyclists. Rory, are we being bold enough? I think we are, and I think ultimately with transport policy like this, you're, you're constantly trying to strike a perfect uh, balance. 
to answer the question, Ben, you know, what, what, what might the future look like in 20 years' time? Well, I would see it as, as that, that, that balance having been struck. Good cycling infrastructure for those who choose to cycle. I don't think the future will mean car-free city centres. I don't think it should mean that. I think we should be striving at a national level to have low-carbon cars being affordable as a, a reality for people, more car-sharing. If you think about the notion of car ownership from a purely economical point of view, it's pretty absurd, really. We buy cars, they lose a third of the value within minutes, and for most of the time, they stand empty and still. It's, it's not really you, a very efficient it's way of moving you, around. It's interesting you raise that, because people have an emotional attachment to their mm. cars, don't they? Because they like to sit in, they like to listen to Radio Leicester, obviously, as they're driving around. Um, but the fact is, you drive past the park and ride, for example, which has been open for, what, five years now? Mm -hmm. The majority of that car park is still bollarded off. Mm -hmm. It's occasionally half or three quarters full on a busy Saturday, but for most of the week it, it isn't. What do you do to encourage people I, to leave their car? Yeah, I actually think the park and ride has got some big question marks hanging over it. I think uh, as it is operating at the moment, um, it is not making sufficient impact. Would you pull the plug on it? Well, I think there is a question of either completely moving away from it and saying, look, this isn't something that's you know, that's producing the impact that you want, uh, and isn't providing the service that you want, or you look at ways of making it uh, accessible and used by a very much higher proportion of those who are currently using their cars. You see, it's, it's, I, th I think at the moment it's falling between the two stools. Because you hear a lot of people say, well, I would use it if it didn't stop yeah. at whatever it is, 7 o'clock, because yeah. I can't come into the yeah. flicks or I can't go to the yeah. theatre or for a meal or whatever. The, the counter-argument that I've always been told whenever I've done interviews about this is that it's about investing now because in five years, another five years, people will want to use it all the time. The, the, the growth in the use of park and ride has been significant, but not nearly fast enough. And there have got to be some real serious questions, and we are asking them now. I mean, that's why I'm able to talk with some confidence about it. We're asking some questions about where it's going, uh, whether it is making sufficient impact, and if we want to make a real big impact and take a real high proportion of, of cars off the road, what we need to do to make that happen. Just to be clear, you would pull the plug, though, if, if those sums and, and questions didn't, didn't add up? I think both we and the county council, our partners in this, you know, have said that there may well come a point where it is not making sufficient impact to justify the significant subsidy that's going into it um, and we are working closely with them to look at the whole range of options which include at the one extreme from saying well there are better things we could be doing with that money and at the other extreme actually putting even more resources into it to make a real impact okay. uh, but it's neither one thing nor the other at the moment let's move on from uh, transport uh, in the city bob eglinton where are you bob uh, thank you well it is about transport really it's about you connecting leicester project and, the, and my question is is there a, a detailed overall design or plan? Because as developments are publicised, proposed developments, they appear to be piecemeal and rather arbitrary. If you take the Welford Road proposal that you've just put out for consultation, that doesn't seem to join up fully at both ends with other schemes that are in existence or that we know are in the pipeline. Arbitrary decisions, no, Peter? No, they're not, Bob. Uh, and um, the... Information is, uh, is available about how all of those pieces fit together. I think Radio Leicester's covered a lot on it. Leicester Mercury have covered quite, you know, quite a lot of stuff looking at the big picture of what we're, what we're setting out to achieve. It's certainly there on our website. It's certainly there in hard copies. And I'll be delighted, Bob, if you see me at the end to make sure we take your details to, uh, to pass them on to you. Um, but uh, I can understand why people you know, won't necessarily have looked at the big picture of how all of these bits fit, fit together. I assure you they do. Um, and I absolutely determined that we'll continue to do what has been very controversial in many of its parts, but have uh, made a very significant contribution to connecting bits of the core of Leicester together and connecting that core outwards uh, so that people can move around within the city and appreciate the, the many gems that we've got, but it can also get into the city to access them as well. It's interesting, uh, isn't it, that, that, that in a sense the Connecting Leicester project is as a result of decisions made in the 50s and 60s about the way the city should look, yeah. the way the city should work and move about and all that kind of stuff. What is there to say, though, that we're not back, you know, here in this, this meeting in 20 years' time when everybody's saying, you know, that Sir Peter Soulsby did this and did that, and look, we have to unpick it all again? Well... I can't guarantee that they won't be critical in 20 years' time, but I do believe that the response that we've had to what we've done over the last few years, while it's been controversial at the time, has been very 
very, very positive when people have seen the results. Jubilee Square, okay, that's a, the, the highest profile one, but uh, it's only one of many, uh, many schemes that we've done. Um, people were concerned about the loss of car parking. They were concerned about the bus stops that had to be moved. You go and look at it now, look at the way in which it's being used, uh, just by people quite casually during the day, but the way in which events are happening there, the way in which it's being appreciated, the way in which Radio Leicester can do ev events out there, and, uh, and, and, and other people can make things happen. Uh, and uh, I don't hear many voices now calling for a return to that grotty car park. Um, Bob, why do you think that, 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 that it is arbitrary and piecemeal? Give me an example. Well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with Peter about that the information may be fully available somewhere, so maybe my question is more about communication than yeah. about the actual project. But, for example, there is a cycleway over the roundabout on, that leads on to Belgrave Road that we placed a flyover. If you go along that cycle route at the north end, you're deposited on Belgrave Road in the middle of nowhere as a bike, in the middle of a very dangerous area. So I can't see in practice, Peter, if you take that as an actual example of how that's joined up to other bits or other pieces or into a coherent, bigger scheme. Bob, I mean, I readily accept you can always do better in communicating what, what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, there are always lessons to be learned particularly from the sort of comments you make this evening about you know, the extent to which people understand the big picture, as it were. Uh, I promise you there is a big picture, particularly in that, in that particular area. Uh, the big picture shows that joining all the way through to the new bus station uh, in the area at the end of Charles Street. You know, so, so there is a, a strong link for pedestrians and cyclists all the way through that area. Um, as I say, I'll make sure that, uh, that, that, that you get to hear that picture. But always you need to take the message when you're in the sort of job that, uh, that we're doing that, uh, you know, inevitably, not everybody in a city as large as Leicester knows and fully understands what you're doing. And you can always do better in letting them know what you're up to and indeed in listening to what they say about it. Bob, I'm, the mayor doesn't know this, but I have sent in the post, which will arrive in your in your hands just just tomorrow morning, the uh, the deeds for uh, the site of Granby Halls. It's up to you to make a decision as to what you would put on the very high profile site. What would you do with it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't I haven't given that the consideration I need. Has anybody to else, can anybody else help the... help Bob out? What would you do with Granby Halls, one of our most high profile sites up for sale at the moment? Yeah, replace it. Yeah. We've, we haven't got that many ledger facilities, really, for what it used to offer. So I'd, I'd build another Granby Hills there. Chances I, are it'll be flat. Um, what we are doing, actually, elsewhere, and I'll, I'll, I'll see if Rory and, and Sarah want to come in on this as well, but what we are doing elsewhere, actually, is to replace uh, some part of, of Granby Halls in what we're creating in the arena with the riders uh, on Charter Street. It's probably not a street you know. Uh, but it's very near to the flyover we we're just talking about, and it's going to be very accessible. It's brilliant. It's now very, very near to being complete. So, uh, yes, I, I mean, I recognise that when we lost Granby Halls, we lost something that was valuable to the city. Part of it, at least, part of those sort of facilities, will be in the new arena on Charter Street. But there are opportunities on that site. I hope uh, some will come forward uh, for us to see perhaps some other parts of what we had at Granby Halls replaced there. Sarah, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, mean, I, I have a slightly different perspective on this. Having not grown up in Leicester, as most people will be able to hear from my accent, I didn't know Granby Halls when it did exist. So I haven't got that same sort of not slightly nostalgic view that people have of it. And I've been really glad, for instance, the new leisure centre that De Montfort have done um, has made a massive difference being able to access close to the city centre leisure facilities for people who live near us. So I can see why people would want to have some of that but I think it does need to be something that is relevant to people now, and I'd hope that people would come forward with some interesting proposals to really make a success of that site. I think we can't try and replicate exactly the same because people move on and times change and people want a different offer and go to different things and will pay for different things now than they would do previously. So I think we've, we've got to make sure it's something that can be sustainable. The worst thing that could happen is for it to be something to be done there that three, four years down the line, couldn't make itself pay and just sat derelict. I think that would be the worst for everybody. So I hope it's something that meets the needs of people and can last. Rory Palmer, every time we talk about uh, spaces in the city with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, uh, what should happen to them, somewhere at some point in the top of the list, somebody says ice rink. Now, there's, a plan, there's perhaps <laughs> plans for an ice rink around the market. What about an ice rink at Granby Halls? I've never been ice skating. I've never, never fancied it, to be honest. So uh, I'm a very biased He's the wrong uh, one to ask. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I've been. Uh, you've, uh, you've, you've, uh, 
look, I think, you know, there's, there's talk of an ice rink. Uh, it's, it's very, it could be very exciting, it could be very interesting. It's not something I feel particularly strongly about, if, I, if I'm honest. Uh, the madam over here, what's your name, first of all? What's your name? James. Hello. I was just about to ask this, back to the same question. Why can't we have an ice rink? Why do you want one? Why do you want one? It's dangerous, isn't it? You break your leg. <laughs> well, yes, you could do. I can't do that. But we've got to go all the way to Nottingham, haven't they? If they wanted to play ice rink, which we could have one in Leicester. It would bring life back into that part of the city. It's a, I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? And frankly, anything that stops people going to Nottingham has to be a plus point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... Relations with our city, that's yes, a yes, smaller yes, city yes. to the north, are, as you know, Ben, <laughs> absolutely excellent. And, of course, I wouldn't say anything against them. John, However, uh, there is a degree of healthy competition between us. And, um, of course, uh, as I've remarked on several times, they may have an ice rink, but we've got a real king. Uh, <laughs> well, um, maybe a snow dome, then. That's what yeah, it needs that, to be. Go, go for bigger and better. Um, but to be serious, I've talked uh, on a number of occasions uh, you know, with, with potential investors in an ice rink in, in, uh, in Leicester. Indeed, Rosemary Connolly, uh, I've met on a number of occasions. Because of course you remember she, you know, she took part in the in television uh, skating um, uh, programs, um, and uh, she's been quite, quite a champion of, of doing it. I've just uh, t- talked with her on a number of occasions about how we might bring uh, a, an investor to Leicester to uh, to see a, de- a development here. There's two issues, I and mean, one is the site uh, because actually Granby Hall's the site it's a triangle. It, it's just the wrong shape to to put anything on. They couldn't get an ice rink on there. They used to have. Do you remember Gleiss? Some of you will remember it. I mean, I remember it. There's plastic ice. Um, it was rubbish. It, it was rubbish, yes. Sir. Well, you say that. But, but, the, but the fact is, it's a question, uh, the, the serious po- point is, finding a suitable site is not all that straightforward, uh, but also finding a potential investor who thinks it's worth doing one when there are already ice rinks in neighbouring cities. It may be, we just have to recognise that, you know, Nottingham's the place for ice, and we've got plenty of other things that are special to us. So uh, that they don't have. Sir, yeah. what's your name, first of all? Uh, John Betts. People often compare the, like, the Leicester Nottingham issues, and people are saying about ice rinks. The, the real thing that draws me regularly to Nottingham is the ability to go and see uh, concerts and bigger things like that. Now, if it was an ice rink that had the ability to host those bigger venues, because the nostalgia about the Granby Halls is, I went to see the Who there, I went to see the Jam there, the ice rink and the skating thing has always been an in and out fad, but the ability to go and see big bands is the thing that takes people to Nottingham. We put curve in Leicester to draw people from outside, but that only brings a small amount of people. You get an arena that can take 10, 15,000 people and you're bringing a lot of economy into the area and that's what Leicester desperately needs in my I'm, opinion. I'm inclined to agree, but I think we've also got to talk about using our current assets more creatively, which is why uh, I had the pleasure recently of talking with Wasim Khan about the cricket ground. Now, it's not uh, you know, without its problems, using the cricket ground or Tigers or, or King Power uh, for events, but we actually do have some, some big spaces there, and using them uh, in ways that you know, don't cause too much of a nuisance in the neighbourhood uh, actually does have far more potential than we as a city have yet made, uh, you know, taken advantage of. Has anybody bought their ticket for Elton John yet? At Grace Road? They are. It's about £60, £70 pounds a, a head to but, go. But, but, but that's what you pay if you go to something in Nottingham as well. Yeah. I, I bought a ticket to see Meatloaf there and, and, got, and got there to discover it was cancelled. <laughs> now there's so the like a there, all right? <laughs> John, what's your, I know you've got another question. Oh, I, was, I was just saying, though, the, the venues that you're just talking about, the scale of those are at another level, that there's plenty of places doing that size. It's that Nottingham Arena, Capital Arena sort of size. Yeah, the but, 10, I mean, the, but the cricket ground's we, taking 15,000. So, I mean, that's the that, that, I mean, scale, scale It's of it. seasonal with weather, it's seasonal with other I usage. No, I, I readily accept that. I'm, I'm really not arguing the point. I'm just saying that we do have some things that we could use better. I recognise that Nottingham has the arena space that we do not have. I would argue we've got plenty of things that they don't have as well. But you know, on, on that on, on that ground, certainly when you know when it comes to an arena and to ice, they certainly have the advantage. Michael Tuttle, where are you, Michael? Hello. Uh, yes, my question is, how can removing three fire engines from Leicester City area not compromise the safety of the people who live and work within Leicester? Rory Palmer. <laughs> Look. 
Let's, let's start with a, a simple truth. The current government's assault on pu the public sector and public sector budgets is utterly unprecedented and, in my view, uh, should concern all of us deeply. And I would rather there was a different government taking a very different view of how we invest in public services. I am deeply concerned about the, uh, the proposals out for consultation on the future of Leicestershire's fire service. I think some of those proposals need a, a radical rethink, uh, and I'm far from convinced by, by what we've seen so far. Would you, would you get them to sell or suggest that they sell the new headquarters? Yes. Yeah, if, yeah if, if that could help the bottom line and continue the investment in, in real frontline fire services, which is what people want, not some fancy HQ somewhere, then that's what, that's what ought to be considered. As, as, you know, and I think there's other options that need to be considered uh, to enable that rethinking and, and uh, a different set of, of options for the future to be considered. Sir Peter Salisbury. I'm in, uh, entirely in agreement with Rory. I think uh, what has uh, been put out to consultation has left a lot of questions unanswered. Uh, how you are able, and it was implied in one of the earlier questions, how, how they think it is possible to uh, fight fires in the centre of a city, we were talking about the traffic earlier on, when the fire engines have to, and the fire uh, the, and rescue service have to fight down the Welford Road uh, coming in from Wixton. Uh, it's very hard to uh, believe that that's a, a credible and, and adequate level of cover uh, in the in the centre of the city. But well, we've got a, a series of proposals out to uh, out for consultation. Uh, what we don't have uh, are decisions. Um, and at the end of this process, having heard all the concerns that have been expressed, uh, we certainly need to have better answers from the fire service management that we've had so far to give us a reassurance we would need to give any sort of approval to them. If at the end of this process, uh, these, the, the, the suggestions that have been put forward uh, through consultation and so forth are those that are, that are to be reenacted, do you have any, any powers to say, well, actually, you're not providing the service that I, as the city mayor, oh, yeah. require? We um, have a joint fire authority, uh, city, county and Rutland. It's in proportion to the size of our population, so obviously the, the, you know, the county are the largest, largest partners there. But frankly, uh, it's going to need a consensus between all of the, uh, the three elements, the city, the county and Rutland, but how, uh, for any proposals to be addressed. But how do you make that work then? Because Nick Rushton, leader of the county council, has said uh, very volubly that we'll make these cuts, there will be no difference no. to the provision that people receive. What is inescapable? is the scale of the cuts that the government have made in the grant to the fire authority. What is theoretically possible, although nobody's actually managed to, to win it, um, is for a fire authority to go to the people and ask a referendum to, to raise some more money locally. Uh, it's problematic because it costs a fortune to do it and the outcome's uncertain. But that's not to say it might not be what we, have to, we end up having to do. Uh, it might well be. That, you know, the right thing to do is actually put it to the people and, to, and for them to decide whether they want to, uh, to stump up what's necessary to fill the gap in the coffers that the government has left. Is there, is there space within this discussion for agreement or do you think that that's... that's oh yes, I, I very much hope there will be. Um, and uh, what uh, both city and county have said is that uh, this is consultation. Uh, decisions get made in February. Uh, the reports of the consultation will be made sometime this side of Christmas. Uh, so there's a long way to go yet before there's any, any decision made. And uh, I would anticipate that uh, out in the county, there are very serious concerns being expressed to the county council, and indeed out in Rutland there are concerns being expressed in the same way as they're being expressed here in the city. Michael, what are your specific concerns? Uh, Mark, well, first of all, I understand about the political position that we're in, and I wish we got a different uh, government as well, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And, and I understand that there are massive uh, constraints on budgets, and I understand that. But I don't think that um, the Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service have done all they can to explore other options well, to, yeah. to save this money and I, I really and yeah. and it's reassuring to hear that you've got great concerns yeah. as well because yeah. i know you you're on the combined fire authority i so. am indeed yes yes uh, I, uh, and, and in the end we'll be part of the decision making process but i mean Roy, you know, I mean, Roy was making the you know the point about uh, you know the concerns that we've got uh, and the ones that I, I share entirely do you have specific concerns about because you know it seems to me there's a lot of talk about figures and, and provision and you know that kind of stuff but it's actually about Public safety, do you have concerns for that? I do have concerns for public safety, and that's not just it within uh, the Leicester City area. It's, it's yeah. what you've alluded to already. It's about in the, in the county as well. But uh, to, to, 
sell central fire station and remove the three appliances that they've got there, two pumping appliances and an aerial ladder platform, it's inevitably going to uh, increase the attendance times for people that live within the city. Um, and as, as a firefighter who's, who's worked for, I'm in my 28th year now, I, I'm, I'm well aware of um, the importance of getting the right amount of resources to an emergency incident when people's lives are at risk as quickly as you possibly can. Now, uh, Leicestershire Fire Service say that all we have to do is get one fire engine within 10 minutes to a life risk. Now, at the minute, in Leicester City, I would say that you would get two in less than five minutes. Yeah. and not one in 10 minutes. So I actually think that the proposals will have a significant effect on the people that not only live in Leicester, but in the county as well. And people will, be, will have to wait longer for, for a fire appliance. And that's the last thing you want to do if you're trapped in a car or if you're trapped in, in, in a property fire and, and, you know, you, and, the, and the house is filling, filling the smoke and you can't get out. You need somebody there as quickly as you can. So thank you very much anybody do, do, listen do, do people other people in the in the audience have concerns just stick your hands up if you have specific concerns Val. what's your name first of all hello chris bilby i've actually got a, an associated question for peter i mean the gist of the question is is you are a member of the combined fire authority and basically i wonder why the proposals for these cuts were allowed to go out for consultation without a, a better level of scrutiny, especially as they seem to be so different from the, the past chief fire officers um, alluded levels of cuts that were required. And, and I wonder why that was allowed to happen by, by yourself and Nick Rushton um, at, at that time, why it wasn't questioned more deeply at that point. Well, I can assure you they were questioned, and um, they are the professional judgment of the senior management of the fire authority. And I think it is very reasonable that they should apply their professional judgment and put some proposals forward. What we then have a duty to do is to make sure we don't just accept them, but that we actually have consultation, particularly we have the feedback from those people who know what they're talking about, which I think includes some of those in the audience here this evening, uh, who actually have to do the fire and rescue business on the ground. Um, and I think some of the questions and the issues that have been raised by you this evening and by your colleagues and others as part of this consultation process have been a very healthy check. Uh, on what was put forward by the, uh, by the management. What is ultimately for us to do uh, is to take what has been said to us and what you're saying this evening back and make sure that uh, we don't just nod through some proposals that uh, are, are have management. We've got a duty on behalf of the people of Leicester and Leicestershire to, uh, to listen to what's being asked, uh, to try and get some answers to it, uh, and then to decide whether they are acceptable uh, and whether there are alternatives. There was an open letter sent to the uh, fire authority today, actually, from senior just retired fire officers. And um, one of those I spoke to today, the, his primary concern was actually in the consultation. The consultation didn't meet basic requirements and so forth. It wasn't adequately publicised. There wasn't enough of it. I know that there were two more added towards the end. But that's a, that's a fair point, isn't it? And that, and that really is under your purview, isn't it? No, I, th I, you know, I, mean, I, I actually think that the issues have been raised this evening have been raised at the consultation meetings and that are raised in, the, in, that, in that letter that we've had have been uh, given proper opportunity to be expressed, um, will be listened to and while of course uh, you could always have more consultation meetings, actually I think that uh, we're getting the message very clearly. Is we're hearing those if questions. If they hear that the consultation uh, wasn't wide enough or whatever, whatever it was, then actually they think well they're not listening anyway, they'll do what they want to do. Yeah but I think I've indicated this evening Ben that we are listening. Uh, you know, I've already indicated my scepticism about some of the proposals that have been put forward and my sympathy with some of the questions that people have asked, to which I don't think they've had adequate answers yet. So, uh, you know, I don't think uh, it can be suggested that we're just pushing this through regardless. We're listening, I'm responding, uh, and I'm absolutely certain uh, that, uh, you know, what has been said to us uh, has got to be properly answered uh, as part of the, you know, response to the consultation. Uh, Madam, what's your point? I understand that you may be listening. Um, I personally myself attended a consultation at Central Fire Station. I've also sent an email to Nicholas Rushton, who I believe is the chair of the CFA, and he sent it to the fire service headquarters. So my email was sent to fire service headquarters to um, the chief fire officer, 
and then I received an email back via a PA to the directors and that email was CC'd into Richard Chandler, yourself, Nicholas Rushton and Andrew Brodie. It doesn't give me much faith in the combined fire authority, if I'm honest, um, and it doesn't make me feel like anybody's concerns are going to be listened to and taken into account. But that's a powerful point, isn't it? Because people do increasingly feel that people in power that make decisions say they're listening, but actually aren't. How do you suggest that actually you are listening? Ben, I would, we wouldn't be here this evening if, you know, if we weren't actually wanting to hear what people say and listen to it. And I wouldn't have given the sort of responses I've given to the questions I've had on this and other issues uh, if I wasn't uh, sensitive to what people actually feel about things uh, and prepared to take them on board. Give me an example of when you've made a decision yourself, you know, in the executive, and you've then gone and, and talked to people and thought, you know what, actually, I think we need to review that. Yeah, quite a load of the Connecting Leicester stuff, Ben. Actually, quite a load of that connecting Leicester stuff. The initial proposals uh, are very, very different from what we actually did, and, and that's high-profile stuff. It's, it's on the record. That's why. That's why I choose it. Um, you know, we made a lot of changes to a lot of those proposals as a result of listening to people, uh, and that's true of uh, you know a whole range of decisions making we've, take, we've taken over the last four years. We've tried to do it. Um, by having consultation before coming to final decisions. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, we've got a good record of listening uh, and also a good record of actually acting on what we've heard. Maria Cook, where are you, Maria? Now, I'm just wanting to know, I live on Saffron Lane, and in August I was approached by a neighbour to tell me there was a traffic warden outside about to put a parking ticket on my car. I parked there for 21 years, and I've received a letter back to say there is parking restrictions on the south side of the island, but they're not on the other side, but they've both got a bus lane in them with the same parking restrictions. So I just wondered why suddenly we've been told we can't park on the pavement. Which of you is a uh, supremo I, I, I of parking? Oh, Sarah, 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 Sarah's drawn the short straw. Okay, Sarah. Because although she's responsible for children's services now, she used to have responsibility for neighbourhood services. So it's, it's hers. You're over. the yellow line czar. Okay. <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> no, well, I'm not particularly, and I never have been particularly, but in this one, there are a number of things being tried out in different parts of the city in response to concerns around people parking on the pavement, which I think is what you'd said had been happening. It might be, and it should be, that wherever these things are, are tried, and I think they're trying different ways in different places, they should be letting anybody know in that area. I don't know if yours is one of the areas they're doing it, because I don't know which no, ones it is. I just got this knock on my door from a neighbour. Telling All me to get out sudden. quick to move my car. Well, we can find out about that individual one. But what, what there has been across the city, uh, a, there was um, quite a long piece done by one of the scrutiny groups looking at pavement parking. It's an issue that people raise concerns about right through the city for a range of reasons. That some at times it's about people with disabilities not being able to get past. Sometimes it's actually if people don't park on the pavement in some parts of the city, the roads aren't wide enough for cars to get down. There are all sorts of pros and cons. There is a bus lane outside my house. Which I, is, think, I think Rory made yeah, it. Rory, I want to know why the bus lane was put there. he's one of the local ward yes, councillors. I, I certainly dealt with some queries such as this during the summer. And I, I, yeah, what, what happened uh, was that we gave a couple of our enforcement wardens scooters and they, they came out here. They didn't know the area, didn't actually know the traffic restrictions. And actually the, some of those tickets were, were put out by mistake and should have been sort of rescinded. Have they been? Uh, well, I know some were because I've had one feedback from was residents. Outside they, the dentist. Sorry? One person was parked outside yeah. the dentist yeah. and they got one slapped yeah. on the car. I mean, I mean it's, it's that stretch of pavement up there, isn't it? Yeah, it's I about 20 foot wide and people have always parked I did send an email and I was yeah. polite. I said it would be polite yeah. for you to let us know. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a couple of wardens. They got their scooters the first That's day. They right, came yeah. out here a little I bit mean, sort of excitable and sort of had a... Over keen, I think. But I thought we'd dealt with it. If yours hasn't been, if you want to see me after, we'll sort it out. No, no, it's been dealt with now. Yeah, but okay. All right. it's oh, a fact that he was, um, you know, I was talking to him and he suddenly started taking pictures of my car yeah. while I was talking to him. Yeah. Has anybody else had, because whilst, whilst, whilst they're here, if you've got any tickets you need sorting out, <laughs> uh, <laughs> has anybody got any more? It's not, it's not quite how it works. No. It's not quite how it works. <laughs> Jack, where's Jack? Jack, Jack Riggle. My question is one concerning animal welfare. Um, and given that fur farming was banned by the Labour-led government in the UK, I just wonder if Leicester City Council and the Mayor can do anything to oppose the sale of fur, which is legal still, within the city, 
I think there are cases of animal welfare issues being taken on by city councils, such as foie gras and shark fins in the past. Sarah? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one to pick up. We've got a strong track record in the city of um, doing whatever we can around animal welfare um, and around trying to make sure that the best possible ethical policies are followed within the city. And that ranges from things like the fact that the city's had a, a very long-standing ban on um, circuses visiting the city that use animals, which sadly are still in place, in not in place, those bans in other parts of the country. Um, I think this is one we can pick up uh, and have a look at. There, there have been some restrictions put on what we can and can't do as a local council, but I think that was one we can take up. What, so give, give me an idea of what you would like, like to see. Well, the precedents that I've, that I've kind of discovered are, for example, Cambridge City Council has said banned shark fin soup on their premises. We can't, there's no bylaws that can be implemented across the city. It will cover the markets, for example, and premises like those, they won't, would not be able to sell them if the City Council made that decision. Um, so I don't think they do at the minute, but it will prevent it being brought in in the future. Can you, can you stop people bringing fur into the city to sell it? Mm. No. no, I don't think you can. No. no. But you can but make, presumably, you can make a... You say that, hmm. we, we can make decisions about things that we um, purchase as a, as a council. We can make decisions around um, how we set up some of our contracts around things like that, and that's how we tend to, to look at it in terms of influence. Yeah. We're a lot, we, we can't just say that anybody... Um, isn't allowed to come in who does that, but we can look at other ways of supporting and, and helping to prevent. Okay. We are coming up to the last question this evening, but before we get to it, is anybody else that's got a burning question that hasn't put one forward yet so far? Stick your hand up. Uh, it's about the council and council housing. Um, my friend lived in a council house for over 30 years. Her name on the council thing, uh, her house... Her father came to live with her when he was ill. He died six weeks ago. She has now lost her council house. No alternative has been offered. Rory Palmer. I'm, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's difficult to talk about individual circumstances about, about knowing all of them. I certainly, what the policy is on, certainly talk on afterwards. We do, we do have a, a tenancy succession policy, and mm. and that is there to you know to you know offer some protection and reassurance to people in those sort of circumstances. She's now classed as a single person, so it's gone down to the bottom of the list. No, but, but right. she shouldn't have lost the tenancy. Lost the tenancy. That's a bit I'm puzzled by. Right. That, that, so we can happily talk after and try and resolve that. I mean, Absolutely. We do sometimes have some very difficult cases, you know, where you know people have lived in a family home, uh, and the tenant, you know, sadly dies, uh, and other members of the family are left in uncertainty. We, we've got some fairly good policies to try and you know ensure that uh, where something genuinely is a family home. Uh, you know, people are, are able to continue there. So I'm surprised by this one. So and maybe we can uh, look into I'm happy to take it up afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Can you stay behind and we'll yes. make sure that yes. you know, the information yeah. gets across? Yes, Thank that's you. fine. Thank you. Gentleman in the front in the, in the red. Right. When people are arrested for a serious crime, they are bailed. That means they can go out, do the same thing again before they actually go to court. Why don't they put them in a cell overnight, put him in front of the judge next morning and deal with it there and then. Or remand him to prison for a higher court. Uh, so Peter Salisbury, uh, you're on the uh, fire authority running the city council. What about running the police as well? Maybe well, police commissioner, that's up for grabs. It's an interesting point because the mayor of London uh, actually does have the Metropolitan Police as part of, his, part of his responsibility. But, of course, it's a rather different system there, and he doesn't have many of the responsibilities that a mayor has in the city like Leicester. Um, what we do have, of course, uh, is uh, a constabulary, a police constabulary, that we work very closely with, uh, and who are um, often uh, very, very responsive. Sarah, actually, I'm going to pass to her, because uh, Sarah, uh, in a previous role, uh, when she was uh, responsible for neighbourhoods, did uh, represent me on the um, police um, and crime panel, is that, is that what it's called? And uh, has actually, I think, had much more experience than I in working with the police uh, on, poli on, on issues. OK, so for something like this, I think the, the first thing is the principle in this country of, of even when you're arrested, you, you are still innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. And I think that's something that it's really important that we, we do hold on to. And I understand what you mean. And certainly when it's a very high risk case where they've got a concern that somebody is um, likely to do something again straight away, particularly where there's violence involved, they will remand them and they don't get bailed in the same way or the bail for them is set at a much higher level to make sure that they are kept secure. 
Um, when it is of a lower level, then um, they are often bailed. That gives both the police and the crime prosecution, criminal prosecution service the opportunity to be able to collect the evidence and to be able to present it. If you're trying to scrabble around and do it straight overnight, that doesn't give either the victim or the potentially the perpetrator the opportunity to be able to make sure that the case is properly hers and that all the evidence is presented. And I think that would mean we could end up with miscarriages of justice. I think where, where there are some difficulties is where where um, people are um, let out on bail and they do commit another crime. The criminal system tends to look um, very, very seriously on that, and that does tend to result in a longer prison sentence um, when that happens. So, Peter Salisbury, how often do you sit down with the, with the Chief Constable and talk about policing provision, policies, you know, the way that they do these things? Uh, not as often as I would wish to. Why? Uh, I, I, I do, do it with the Chief Constable. Um, it's on record. I mean, I have been critical of the fact that the police no longer have a divisional commander with responsibility for the city area. And I, you know, I've taken that up with the, with the chief constable. I, th I don't know whether, whether that's the case in many or any other cities, but certainly their reorganisation, which, again, like we are talking earlier on, has been driven by, uh, you know, re need to re reduce expenditure, has led to them reorganising in such a way that now everything is either at a very local level or is run from Enderby, from the police headquarters. We don't have the presence of a divisional commander in Mansfield Street in the way that we used to have. And I've said this to them on many occasions, it is something that leads to much poorer communication than used to be the case when somebody actually could say, it's my job to talk with the mayor, to know what's going on in the city, to make sure that we're engaging with the council. Um, I, I've said that, I, 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 re I regret that, but I do nonetheless uh, have opportunities to meet with the Chief Constable uh, perhaps on a less frequent basis than used to be the case with, with the Chief Superintendent who was responsible for the city. Joan, where are you? Joan Wilkinson. It's a continuous question that I ask myself and lots of others. Why is the A426 still a 24-hour bus lane? We start with buses, so let's end with them. Sir Peter Salisbury. I have to say... Joan, that that is the politician's answer. That is a very good question. <laughs> but actually it is, because um, my colleagues are currently looking at the way in which we do bus lanes in the city. Uh, and uh, Councillor Ross Wilmot, who chairs the Scrutiny Commission dealing with this, is leading a panel that's actually looking at the um, way in which we um, have our bus lanes in the city, the way in which we make some of them 24 hours, some of them are just peak hours, uh, some of them are discontinuous, some of them we allow parking in, that there's a whole load of issues. And, and none of them, at the moment, we, uh, we enforce with cameras. So these are all questions that uh, he and his, his panel are looking at. And it's an opportunity for me to say that although uh, you've got me as mayor uh, sitting here in front of you, together with two assistant mayors, of course there are other elected politicians in the city who have a very important part to play uh, in scrutinising what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, see Virginia Cleaver at the back there who's uh, the chair of uh, one of the uh, one of the scrutiny commissions and uh, you know she uh, and her colleagues uh, hold us to account but they also help us to develop matters of policy and one of the areas where I don't think we've got a coherent and consistent policy is about bus lanes in the city so uh, I come back to where, where I started. It's a very good question. I very much hope we'll soon have a proper answer for you. Do you feel you've, you've got an answer to your question? No. no. Why is it, is it a bus lane? It should be running when the buses are... I'll tell, tell you the answer to that. It's because the bus lanes in the city have been installed at different times with different priorities on different stretches. And it's led to different arrangements on different streets, and some of them being 24 hours when they don't need to be, and some of them only being peak hours when they actually be, need to be throughout the whole working day. Surely, Sir Peter, it should be, if it's a bus lane, it should be operational That's precisely when the, the point, buses... That's precisely the point I'm making. So I don't, mean, I, so what I'm saying a, is, Joan, I don't think it makes sense either. So does that mean a review? Yes, yes, they are thoroughly reviewing it at the moment. Uh, and, 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 and when this first started, you know, yeah. this 24 hour, I even wrote to your office yeah. and I invited you I, for a coffee at my house I, and just to see the, the I, congestion I that it causes. I am entirely agreeing with you. It doesn't but make you didn't, sense. You didn't take it me doesn't up on that. make sense. 
Uh, what we've got are different restrictions on different roads for no good reason. I'm very much, uh, I, I'm very much, uh, I'm very confident that my colleagues who are looking at this right now will, in the next couple of months, come up with some better answers, some firm proposals, and. I was being asked earlier on about things that have made a difference to our decision making. Well, actually, one of the things that makes a difference to our decision making is what the councillors tell us about their area so does in general, so, and, sorry, what, and, what, and what in this case councillors tell us about big areas of policy. But, but Nigel Porter, my councillor, uh, he's been all for you know not making this 24 hours. So he's tried, you know, his best in, in the council, but it's just not heard, not well, heard at well, all. Well, actually, um, I, I've, I've had a number of very constructive discussions with his colleague, uh, Councillor Adam Clark, who's actually one of my assistant mayors. Uh, and he, uh, Adam, has been very, very supportive of this review, particularly because of the experience that has been on the A426 corridor. So does this rise to the top of your to-do list for tomorrow morning to give that all a, a bit of a shove? <laughs> no, I, I, I promise you, and I've, I've said this to Ross, and, and, and indeed at his commission that you know that's doing this, that are very much welcome the work he's doing. And in fact, by coincidence, um, they are meeting. I think on Thursday of this week uh, at their regular meeting, and he'll be giving an update on how the work is going. I will take that opportunity. I promise you to tell him that if he needs any, any um, impetus behind it, uh, I was asked a question about it at the Pork Pie Library, and I want to know the answers too. And remember, there's a cup of tea and a biscuit waiting for you there to come and prove to you how annoying it is. <laughs> oh, well. I'm, I'm so frustrated, Sir Peter, that I actually wrote to your office, well, I wrote to you, Well, and uh, asked you to come and have a coffee and witness the chaos that it causes, you I, know. I, I, I promise you, I do go down the A426, and I don't well, just... Don't I, live I, on it, No, so. I know, I know I don't. <laughs> Although, actually, I have been... Uh, I, I, know I haven't t taken up your invitation. I have visited people who do live on the A426. Yes, I have. Just opposite where you live, I have visited them. And as a result of that, we have taken measures to stop some of the uh, cutting through that's taken place uh, in, in, in that particular area. Okay. So it isn't as if I haven't been down the A426, and indeed it isn't as if I haven't driven down the A426, because okay. I do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the end. We're going to ask for any quick-fire questions, any uh, just very quick ones for the end. First of all, give me your name. Susan, Susan Eppel. And what's your question? Um, it's about the A426, really. We live on Elson Road, and it's a very busy road, but I don't blame the bus lanes in particular. I think at the sheer number of cars, there's too many cars, and we're never going to resolve that, really. So they're all part of the problem, basically. Just too much traffic. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that we started off on transport, and we're going to finish off on transport by the sounds of things. Um, Virginia Cleaver is over, is over here. What's your question? I would like to ask, um, Peter, if we can have more done and more um, uh, communications about Grow Your Own, because it's one of the best things that we've been doing in Ayers Monsell with the Blooming Ayers Monsell scheme. We really want, and you know this because you've been down there, Ben, we've got the back of the Ayers Community Centre now as a Grow Your Own project. We've got a, a community orchard on Featherstone Drive. Rolston School's got a fantastic Grow Your Own project. We really want more people in Leicester to do Grow Your Own. And so I want you to do more, Peter, to encourage people to do grow their own. It's one of the best things we can do for the health and well-being of Leicester. May I make a suggestion? We were talking about this earlier on today. Granby Hall site, a magnificent grow-your-own vista of raised beds, dahlias, cabbages. Uh, do you know what, Virginia, I mean, Virginia knows the answer to the question. I entirely agree with her. And, and what they've done in, in that area and what she's, she's, she's helped with has been tremendous. But... Uh, I'm going to actually pass to the uh, Deputy Mayor to answer this, because, um, as well as being Deputy Mayor, he is also a Council of Rares so he actually knows the answer. Well, I think what Virginia was doing there was uh, a roundabout way of inviting you to come and help us uh, uh, dig, dig the beds ready for, for next year down, down at Ayers Monsell Community Centre. And uh, uh, I think, you know, the whole uh, sort of revolution that we're seeing nationally around growing your own food is something we're trying to make happen here in Leicester. We've got some great projects, not just in Ayers Monsell, but right across the city now, uh, as well as a great project in, in New Parks. We've got Saffron Acres just down the, the road from here. I think we need to do more to, to encourage that and support that. And, uh, well, sorry to interrupt, what about those? I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? I think Grow Your Own, it's certainly something we've done on Radio Leicester for three or four years now, and it has extraordinary effects for the price of a packet of seeds. It, the, the effects are much wider than that. Some cities are using scraggly bits of, of un 
developed land yeah. when they're saying, well, look, you, you don't have any rights over this, yeah. but for this mm. season, you can rotivate yeah. this, you can plant yeah. some stuff. Is that something that I'd, could happen? I, I'd love us to move towards doing that. It's something we we're talking about at the moment is how we manage open space and green space across the yeah. city. I've seen it in, in other parts of the country and, and indeed in other, in other countries. American cities have a, a tradition of doing this where you've got some spare public land or some public land not doing anything. Just grow some cabbages there or some potatoes. And, and people say, well, won't people nick the food? Well, sort of the idea, really, uh, that you, know, you grow the food for people to, to have access to and, and make good use of. And I think it'd be a great thing for our communities. It'd make probably some of our open spaces look a bit, a bit nicer if we had some you know, nice red cabbages or some sprouts growing. I think it'd be brilliant. And of course, Saffron Acres, that great project, just, just what, a, a, a few, Acres, a few yeah. walk, uh, minutes That's walk from here, yeah. is, is an extraordinary nationally yeah. held up brilliant. example. But, you know, we could do more of that, couldn't we? If it works, if it works in one place, there's no reason why it can't work across the city. Absolutely, and we, we published a couple of years ago the Leicester Food Plan, which set out uh, an ambition for, for this sort of stuff to be happening. We put some resource behind that. In terms of the small projects, we introduced a new grant scheme in, in every part of the city last year to, to back those small projects. And, and Saffron Acres, which is a great enterprise now, a huge contract to, provide, to, su to supply jam to a, a well-known supermarket chain, uh, that started from a very very, very small project with a little bit of money from a you know a local community funding pot there's lessons for us to learn from projects like saffron acres we need to to give other groups the chance to learn those lessons and and make leicester you know i think our ambition should be nothing nothing short of uh, the best local food growing city in the country i think we've got the energy the desire the ambition to make that happen uh, and supportive journalists who like to get stuck in as well <laughs> Maybe just, fi maybe just finally, uh, Peter, you and I were talking about your signs for the city recently. We were talking about previous signs. Environment City, first Environment City, remember that? Maybe we could actually be, by being bold and ambitious, we could turn over part of our parklands into growing cabbages. We could allow yes. some of this space, which I know has a huge commercial value, and say, actually, this acre, we're going to grow stuff on it. Yeah. Well, as Rory said, we're actually looking at our, our open space at the moment. Um, I've announced today about uh, you know, a thorough review of our buildings in the city, but actually in parallel with that, we're also looking at our open space. And part of that is making better use of some of the areas that uh, we've got that could be better cultivated. Uh, in some areas, we could just be doing be be better in terms of the wildlife that we, that we encourage there. But actually, we shouldn't forget that we've actually got some very established and very committed people in the allotment societies across the city. Um, and uh, you know, those allotment societies and the people who hold those allotments uh, are very passionate uh, about uh, you know, what they do and, and what they grow, um, and uh, very keen to continue to work with them to, uh, to make sure they continue to flourish. And that we look at ways in which we might bring more land back into allotment use, as well as the sort of informal use you've been talking about. I think there's something as well about the smaller plots of land. The idea of turning over large parts of our parks, for some people that'd be really overwhelming, needing to go in and, and work on something like that. Whereas through schemes like the Know Your Own Neighbourhood, you can turn fairly small areas that have been grassed over, that have got a bit grotty over time, into really small-scale grow-your-own projects that people within quite a tight community can give a manageable amount of time to and enjoy the benefits of. I think sometimes, certainly, you know, ideally, I'd love to have an allotment. Realistically, I know I haven't got time, and it'd end up full of weeds, and I wouldn't get anything useful out of it. But the idea of being able to go and contribute to something along with neighbours that's on a much smaller scale is manageable for people. People. So I think it's about having different levels for what suits. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for a stimulating evening. Thank you very much indeed for your questions and your interaction with our panel this evening. I don't think this is the only one. I think there may be plans for more of these in the future, which, uh, of course, we would like you to engage with. But please uh, show your thanks for our panel this evening in the appropriate way. <laughs>